Hello everyone, my name is Sebastian, and welcome to the MATLAB and Simulink Robotics Arena. This is the third video in our Walking Robot series, and this one is on trajectory optimization. To recap what we've done in the last two videos, I'm going to open a Simulink model of a walking robot. What we've done so far is create a physical three-dimensional model of the mechanics of a walking robot, as well as configured it so that you can switch between different types of actuators, including ideal motion, a closed loop torque controller, or a closed loop controller with a motor model. If I run the model, you'll see where we've left off so far. We have a robot that's able to walk, since we're using some libraries on the file exchange for modeling contact forces between the foot and the ground. However, the walking gait has been provided already in a parameter file. In this video, our goal is to use optimization techniques to try improve or come up with an optimal uh, walking gait for this robot. So here's our agenda for this video. First, we'll talk about optimizing Simulink simulations using MATLAB, as well as toolboxes like the Optimization Toolbox and the Global Optimization Toolbox. We'll explain how we've set up the optimization problem for the robot walker. And finally, we'll talk about some tips for speeding up simulation, because optimization involves simulating repeatedly. So for MATLAB, you can do the following. First, you can use the sim command to run Simulink models. What this lets you do is configure the configuration parameters of simulation, as well as collect the results of the simulation in the outputs of this command. You can also analyze that simulation data. So once you have the outputs, you can pick individual signals and perform any kind of mathematical or other analysis operations on that data. If we package that up into a function, that can then be something reusable and modular where you know you can pass in some inputs and inside the function you will simulate the model, process your data, and receive some kind of output out of that. Once you have a function like this, you can hook it in to optimization algorithms. For example, a genetic algorithm that would repeatedly run a Simulink simulation uh, towards optimizing some kind of cost function. That being said, what we'll do then is take our walking robot simulation and optimize the robot walking trajectory. Let's break down the optimization problem by first talking about the inputs. We're going to create several assumptions for our model so that we can control uh, what our search space is for this model. First, we're going to have a fixed number of waypoints for our walking trajectory. In the example that I'll show you, we're going to use six, let's say. Then we're going to discretize the angle values that these trajectories can take. So let's say we're going to use two and a half degrees. We're going to also have a fixed gate period. So in other words, each waypoint is going to run at a, you know, at a known periodic interval. And also, as we've done in the previous videos, that our left leg is going to exactly mimic the motion of the right leg, but lag that by half a period. And then we'll employ some of the cubic spline trajectory interpolation that we saw in the previous video to make our walking trajectory smoother than just you know a set of linear waypoints. If we set up our problem like this, we're going to have 18 optimization parameters. And this comes from six waypoints times three joints. So each of the three leg joints, the hip, the knee, and the ankle, are going to have six waypoints that are going to repeat over a sequence. And like we said, because of our assumption that the left and the right leg are using the same gait, just out of phase, then we're cutting down that search base by half. So what we get ultimately is the converting of a gait, like you see in the figure, to a set of 18 integer values. Let's talk about the outputs of the optimization. The outputs typically come from a cost function that you set up. And this is going to be how you can mathematically encode how well your optimization problem is doing for a certain given set of input parameters. We've defined a set of good costs and bad costs. The, the good cost has to do with the final distance traveled. So the further your robot is able to walk uh, within the finite simulation time is, is a good thing for the cost function. In other words, the, the faster you go in 10 seconds, we, we're going to reward that. And secondly, that the robot did not fall. That is, if our simulation doesn't terminate early, and then we're able to run it for the full 10 seconds, there are also some elements of our simulation results that we want to penalize or give a 
negative reward to. That involves, for example, the average angular velocity of the robot. That is, we want a robot to move in a straight line. So if we start deviating from that, we're, we're going to place a penalty on that. And the other one, which was the most creative, um, in my opinion, that ended up giving really good results, was this notion of an aggressiveness of joint trajectory. And I'm going to show you some figures to explain that. The trajectory on the left, you see, has a lot of bouncing up and down, or a lot of inflection points in the trajectory. Whereas the gate on the right is just a single hump. And that is more natural to what you would see for a true you know, human-like or animal-like walking trajectory. So here we've enforced some cost function where you want to have you know, minimal uh, oscillations, so to speak, in your gait. And the way this would look like is, for example, as you see here, if you have a function, the first thing you'll do is use the sim command to collect the simulation outputs from your model. And then once you've processed that data, you encode that in a reward. Um, the, the one thing to note is that the optimization functions typically try to minimize a cost function. So if, if you're doing the opposite or maximizing a reward function, then you can put a negative sign on that value. So we have our inputs and our cost function or, or outputs of the optimization problem, but we still haven't decided which algorithm we're going to use. What I've chosen for this example is a genetic algorithm, and this comes from the global optimization toolbox. The reason I've decided to use a global optimization algorithm is because this walking problem is highly nonlinear. Uh, that means that there are going to be quite a few local minima in optimization. You can see that from the figure to the right uh, because the cost function seems to take a kind of staircase shape. What that means is that our simulation cost function or our reward is actually getting stuck in several local minima and every so often it decides to break out into a you know more optimal uh, section. The, the thing about the genetic algorithm or, or most global optimization algorithms is that they're never really guaranteed to give you the you know the actual optimal or best result. So you likely want to run optimizations multiple times and you know just based on the results that you get from from several optimizations you can try figure out what the best uh, gate would be. So some other things to note to as we talked about before um, we discretized the joint angles so that the search space for this algorithm was finite and all integer which you know just helps with narrowing down the problem more quickly and of course like with any optimization algorithm we have to really tinker with the optimization options to get something that works well for us the things that that i found were most impactful for for this problem were the population size in other words how many different samples are we going to keep track of as we run the algorithm the initial conditions or the initial population. So do we want to start from, you know, just a completely unknown gate or do we want to start from an existing gate that we know works, which can really help us uh, converge quicker. But at the same time, it might help us converge to a local minimum that was guided by that initial condition. And then other parameters like the maximum number of generations or the maximum number of optimization iterations that you want to run as well as parameter bounds. Uh, this was really useful, again, in narrowing down the search space, as well as giving realistic uh, trajectories. For example, one of the parameter bounds that I enforced was that the knee angle of the robot could not be greater than zero because that would mean that the knee is bending forward. And just by my intuition, I, I knew that I didn't want the robot to, to do that, to bend its knee forward. Um, and there are quite a few other bounds and constraints that you can play with. If you want to know more about these algorithms or, or any of the optimization functions, you should uh, check out the documentation because all of these options and then guidelines are listed for, for all the algorithms provided in toolboxes. Let's go right to the software demonstration. So under the Optim folder of this example, which you can download from File Exchange, there is a main script called Optimize Robot Motion, and we'll open that up you'll see that there's quite a bit going on, but I'm just going to quickly run through some of the key things. Uh, the first thing that I, that I want to show you is the optimization options. So here we're creating a set of options for the genetic algorithm solver, and we're doing things like enabling uh, display of the algorithm as it progresses, setting up the 
number of iterations and the sample size of our population, setting up initial conditions, and so on. Going to the next section, you'll see here is where we talk about enforcing the parameter constraints. So the limits, the upper and lower limits of the ankle, knee, and hip joints. And finally, the, the meat of the algorithm is where we're defining the cost function as this uh, separate file called simulate walking robot, as well as using the GA function or genetic algorithm function from the global optimization toolbox, use, uh, again, using that as the previous function as our cost function. Let's dig into this simulate walking robot function to see how we derive that cost function. If I go over here, you'll notice that, again, besides some unpacking of data, the, the main part of the model has to do with running the sim command to extract data from our simulation. And then we take that log data, unpack it, and figure out our cost function. So you see we have uh, the definition of our positive reward, which has to do with the square of the distance traveled and the final simulation time. Then we have our negative reward, which has to do with the angular velocity, as well as the aggressiveness that's computed in the following lines. And then a final calculation of the overall penalty, which is basically the negative of our final cost function. So by running this, this function repeatedly or simulating our model repeatedly, we can put this through our optimization algorithm. So once I've run this script, you'll see a display saying that the optimization has begun with a population of 100 and a max number of generations of also 100. If I go into the Mechanics Explorer as this optimization is running, you'll see that there are several failed simulations for this robot. You'll see that as I'm talking through it, there's a lot of falling and really wild and erratic gates. Now, if I keep running this further and further, uh, eventually we should see that our simulations become more stable as we hopefully converge to a better result. However, you'll notice that this is fairly slow. I mean, you think about the fact that you have to run 100 simulations 100 times, that's 10,000 simulations. And we, you know, we've maybe seen a couple dozen so far. So is this really the best way to approach the problem? There are three main techniques that you can use to speed up simulations for the purpose of optimization, as well as other things like parameter tuning or testing of, of models. The first is accelerator mode. This is a way to actually take your simulation and generate C code from the model. This is essentially a way to compile your model so that it's faster at executing. While the compilation takes some initial time, if you're going to be running the simulation repeatedly, you can observe some speed up. The second thing is fast restart simulation. This is another uh, feature in Simulink in which you can, in a way, freeze the model so that you cannot make any structural changes to it. But as long as all you're changing are things like inputs or tunable parameters, then you can simulate this model repeatedly without recompiling it. So that reduces the downtime between simulations, which is key if you're running 10,000 of them. And finally, there's parallel computing. So you can use products such as the parallel computing toolbox to take advantage of, for example, multiple cores on your machine. Uh, and what that lets you do is run individual simulations in parallel. And of course, that can cause significant uh, speed ups in your results. So just to summarize, all of these techniques are useful if what you're doing is modifying tunable parameters between simulations. And this is absolutely the case with our optimization problem, because all that we're changing between runs is the input trajectory to our leg joints. So let's turn on some of these speed ups and see how that looks in MATLAB. If I go to the top of my optimized robot motion script, you'll see that there are two flags that, that are up here, one of them called Excel flag and one of them called parallel flag. And what I had done for the first run of this optimizer is that I set them both to false. What I'll do instead now 
is set them both to true. If these are set to true, uh, we actually have another helper script called do speed up tasks that takes care of some of these things programmatically. For example, if your parallel flag is enabled, then we're going to use the parpool function, which will enable your basically your default saved profile from uh, the parallel computing toolbox, and then perform any other steps that you need to basically make sure that all the files that, that are necessary are running on all the workers of this parallel system. And then there's other checks too for the acceleration flag. You'll see if that accelerator flag is true, we're doing two things. The first thing is that we're changing the uh, model simulation mode to accelerator mode. And secondly, I'm actually setting it up so that you're no longer able to view the animation in the Mechanics Explorer because that also takes up some of your computation resources. If I go to the simulate walking robot function, that's the one where we had our cost function defined, you'll notice that our sim command already has a way to enable the fast restart simulation. So now that we've added the speed up to our optimization with the acceleration and the parallel flags, I'll rerun the optimization script. The first thing you'll see that appears is this starting parallel pool message. And this is the parallel computing toolbox initiating a set of parallel workers that are going to run our simulations in parallel. And that should give us a significant speed up and increasingly so with the more number of cores or, or other you know, computing workers that we have available. Now, once the parallel pool has been created or initiated, we will start seeing the algorithm results appearing on the screen. So once the plot appears, again, we'll see the optimization progress. In addition, in the MATLAB command window below, you'll see there's going to be a table of results that is also periodically uh, printed. For example, you see that the first generation or the first iteration of the algorithm just completed. We've run 200 simulations or 200 function counts, and our best penalty initially is negative 667. So as the optimization progresses, we should see this value get more negative, or in other words, our reward becomes more positive. So with the magic of video editing, we'll now see what happens as we terminate our optimization. So now the optimization is coming to an end, and you'll see that as the generations go on, our penalty value has decreased or our reward has increased. And finally, we get to 100 iterations. The first thing you'll see as this optimization terminates is the animation of the final walking trajectory. And you'll see that's what it looks like. The robot ends up walking pretty far. Then you'll see a plot of the gate that there was a final resulting gate of this optimization. So the ankle, the knee, and the hip angles. Let's go back to MATLAB here and study our uh, genetic algorithm plot once again. One thing you'll notice is the that staircase looking shape of the cost function. The way that genetic algorithms work uh, because they're global optimization algorithms, they introduce some element of randomness. For example, sometimes your parameters will have a slight change uh, to them, which can cause a big jump in the cost function. And you can see that happening, for example, around 35 generations, as highlighted here. But because of there's so much randomness, first of all, the final trajectory that you see here is not necessarily the optimal. And secondly, there are lots of what are known as stall generations, which are regions in which the cost function does not change for quite a long time. And with a local optimization algorithm, the algorithm might terminate in these situations, but not the case with this uh, genetic algorithm. So once we've got our results, you'll see that a file has been generated for the results, which contain our curve data. What I can do is copy the name of this file and put it through that script that we saw in the previous video that compares the our trajectory with different actuator types. So what I'm going to do here is paste 
my latest file name and run this script for the motion actuation, the torque actuation, and the motor model. And we'll see if the optimization results match up across actuators. Because one thing that happens because of the slight differences in, for example, the motion actuation and the closed loop actuation, um, one of the simulations may not be stable, but the other might. So it looks like the torque actuation simulation looks good. And lastly, we'll see what this looks like for the motor actuator. And remember that this is the slowest simulation of them all. So that will take a little while to complete. Recall from the previous video, once these three simulations have completed, you will see the plots coming up that compare the results. And we should see that right after this robot finishes walking. And here we go. So let's if we expand the joint angles, again, you'll see the differences across the different uh, simulation types or actuator types. And we can see the same with, for example, the joint torques, that there, there are going to be slight differences in, in these. For example, let's zoom into the hip torque at the bottom of this plot. And here you'll see that because of those slight differences in the gate, even the spikes at which the, you know, the contact occurs happen at slightly different times, off by a couple fractions of a second. Okay. However, it seems like all the three simulations ended up being stable, um, which is a good thing. So now that we have this final saved gate, we can keep that in our back pocket. One thing I will note is that because of the nature of the, these uh, random algorithms, I would be running this multiple times. You know, you can just automate this and leave several of these running overnight and determine, you know, if there's any insights you can get about the type of trajectories that were generated. So let's talk about next steps. First of all, optimization can solve different problems. In the example that we saw, we created this optimization with the goal of walking straight as quickly as possible while also trying to keep the aggressiveness of the trajectory down. Um, you can certainly use different optimization goals, different constraints, but beyond that, it's not just the input gate trajectories that we can optimize. You can certainly use optimization techniques for the parameters of algorithms, such as your low level controllers, or to even optimize the robot geometry. For example, if you want to optimize things like the uh, length of the legs or the locations of certain joints or you know the stiffness and damping of the mechanics, and you don't have to do that with MATLAB. There are also graphical optimization tools, uh, and these fall under the Simulink Design Optimization product that let you do this tuning from interactive apps. So if you're interested in that, let us know. The last thing is closed loop walking. The outcome of this optimization trajectory ended up being an open loop gate. Can we use other techniques to teach our robot a way to handle other types of disturbances and have more of a walking policy? And this can be done with techniques such as reinforcement learning. That concludes our walking robot video series. As always, feel free to contact us via email or Facebook and check out the other resources below. Thank you for watching.